essays twenty seven and twenty eight of the romance of the commonplace by gillette burgess this librivox recording is in the public domain essay twenty seven a pauper's monologue understand i am not one of those who are always longing to be rich i do very well ordinarily in the shadow of prosperity though there comes upon me periodically the lust for gold at which times the desire to rush downtown and spend money indiscreetly must be obeyed it is a common symptom paupers tell me and carries with it its own remedy giving much the same relief that bloodletting did of old if so be the practice does not lead to a dangerous hemorrhage i have my ups and downs like most unsalaried bohemians thin purse thick purse at erratic intervals but my spendthrift appetite is curiously independent of these financial fluctuations in fact a miserly restraint is most likely to seize me when my pocket is full and i usually grow reckless when it has no silver lining there are few paupers among us who do not conceit themselves to be artists at spending money and believe the fit intelligence is most wanting in those who have the means i confess that i share their convictions having wasted much time in the study of the situation like those planning a foreign tour i have mapped out the golden road of opportunity and know the itinerary by heart and without trespassing the science of economy of which i am criminally ignorant having been somewhat prepossessed during my sophomore courses i submit there are active and passive categories into which coupon cutters may be relegated the symbol of your moneyed man is the cigar involving a destructive process whether applied to food raiment or ministry to the senses the greed of the collector is of the same flavour it is the difference between spending the money to see and to stage the play that i mean for why should an access of wealth so dull the brain that the battle between the kings of hearts and spades seems more interesting than the game with human knights and pawns i have often been minded to write an open letter to millionaires and offer myself as a master of their sports to guide them through fields of untried sensation and novel enterprises i have my offers tabulated from an hundred dollars upward each involving the inception of activities whose ramifications would provide diversion for years there are twenty young men i know of in this town who are waiting for such a chance why should i not be elected to captain them i promise you the rise and fall of stocks shall not be more exciting than our rivalries indeed brains are for sale at absurd bargains to-day why not play them off against each other in a game of life but these are dreams never to be realized i am no promoter and must play the beggar's part yet i have often wondered how i would be affected if these hopes came true and if some capitalist touched by my appeal seeing this good seed cast upon barren ground opening his heart and purse springs should present me with a modest fortune without conditions could i assume the responsibility of gratitude and fly with the load of obligation that i myself would assume by all rules of fiction no yet if my conscience were seduced i might frame my mind to accept debonairly and do my best tempt me not millionaires for this is my week of longing and my brain boils with adventurous desires yet had i the ear of the benefactor another mood would impel my renunciation for against my will and interest i am forced to acknowledge that others are better fitted to be rich than i who have been a pauper all my life and am not so unhappy in my misery i know some to whom wealth should come as a right as has their beauty and who play an inconsistent part upon the stage of poverty there is a dianemy who knows the names of all the roses and can tell one etching from another she is so instinct with tact and taste that i feel quite unworthy of affluence until she has been served and there too is little sister who is in worse case having once ridden on high wheels and nestled against the padded comforts of life now charioted by street-cars with a motorman for a driver and a conductor for a footman 
and though it was her reverses that gave me chance to be her friend and discover her worth yet i fear i would put back my opportunity ten years to give her the little luxuries she craves she has acquired a relish for the flesh-pots poor little sister and somehow the weakness becomes her as the habit of weeping fitted the eighteenth century ideals of women two more pairs of silk stockings would reinstate her as a lady complete not that anybody but little sister and her laundress would ever see them but they would give her a nourishing satisfaction that is of itself worth while yet again i wonder if little sister grew rich what would become of me i am told that the first pangs of the birth of fortune are felt in the unpleasant acquisition of new claimants to friendship but i do not believe this is so i should myself fear to intrude i am sure there would be so many new relations and obligations that i could not take the friendship simply and naturally i could make love to her by letter perhaps but not in her carriage i would miss the ungloved hand of familiarity and enclose myself in starched formality though i know the pain in so doing would be mutual for the pride of riches is as nothing to the pride of poverty and i am very very poor but surely little sister must be rich again even if i have to wait for the second table and so i gracefully resign my claims to fortune where i am so outclassed and make off into the open fields toward the hills of fame where the brougham of opulence may not follow me though i fare afoot for we do not get rich in my family there is no uncle in patagonia whose death could benefit us and the bag of diamonds the hope of whose discovery sustained my immature youth no longer haunts my dreams for a long time yet i must deny myself the title of gentleman forced as i am to carry parcels over three inches square which i hear is the test of a fashionable caste this is my last gasp i shall be a man again to-morrow and if any millionaire is tempted by this appeal he must make haste but i shall not be rung up from sleep to-night it is the law of society that spend helps save and save helps scrimp and scrimp helps starve essay twenty eight a young man's fancy undoubtedly the most logical though perhaps the least interesting method of opening the discussion of a thesis is that employed by the skilful carver who dissects his duck according to the natural divisions of the subject and proceeds therewith analytically this is the system encouraged in academic courses and is said to enable any one to write upon any subject but such an essay is mighty hard reading unless a writer is so hungry for his theme that he forgets his manners and falls to without ceremony the chances are that his efforts will receive scant attention and so i shyly speak of love so few essayists write with a good appetite and yet see how i restrain myself and perforce adopt the conventional procedure as one too proud to betray his ravening hunger i must be calm i must be polite and you shall know only by my forgetfulness of the salt and my attention to the bones of thought how the game interests me in speaking of love i must let my head guard my heart too for it is in the endeavour to misunderstand women that we pass our most delightful moments they will not permit men to be too sure of them and what you learn from one you must hide carefully from the next so i began my fencing with a great feint of awkwardness like a master with a beginner knowing well enough how likely to get into trouble is any one who pretends innocence for a long time i believed it all a conspiracy of the novelists and that love so ideally depicted was but a myth kept alive by the craft to furnish a backbone for literary sensation but there are undoubtedly many bigoted believers in the theory of love the women however who admit that it is a lost art complained piteously of the ineptitude of the other sex i confess that few men can satisfactorily acquit themselves of the ordeal of courtship without some tuition but once having acquired the rudiments of the profession it seems inconsistent to taunt them with the experiments of their apprenticeship 
it is too much to require a man to make a gallant wooing and then twit him with the promiscuousness by which he won his facility yet some doubtless have learned also to defend themselves against this last accusation it is the test of the past master for the other poor dolts who never see the opportunity for action however adroitly presented who speak when they should hold tongue and leave undone all those things that they ought to have done the girls marry them to be sure but most of the love-making is on the wrong side there are more yawns than kisses the brutal question satisfies the yawp and he bungles through the engagement breaking doggedly through the crust of the acquaintance witless of the delightful perils of thin ice and yet i think the subject might be mastered in four lessons with a good teacher so that a man of ordinary capacity could make a good way for himself this is by no means a new theory it is the foundation of many a comedy of errors this of love with a tutor but go not to school of a maid for she will fool you to the top of your bent nor to a married woman either but to a man like my younger brother here no lothario but one who can keep two steps ahead of any affair he enters if a man be agile and daring with sufficient ardour to assume the offensive having an audacious tongue and a wary eye with a fine sense of congruity and tact withal if he can make love with a laugh and a rhyme as cyrano fought then tis a different matter and he needs no pilot to take his sweetheart over the bar and into the port he must be bold but not too bold carry a big spread of canvas luff reef and tack her with no shuffling cast the lead on the run keeping in soundings and never lose headway when she comes about into a new mood he must bear a sensitive hand at the tiller keep her close up to the wind with no tremble in the leech of the sail and gain advantage from every tide and cross-current better dash against the reef than run high and dry upon the shoal it is a pity is it not to dissect love in such a fashion i should have my hero quite at the mercy of the gale of passion and be swept forward he knows not how and cares not where he should lose his wits and take a mad delight in the fury of the storm seeing in no spot upon his horizon and yet i dare not be warmer for some time i may decide to fall in love myself and i would not have my chances wrecked by any genuine confession of faith set in type to which she might refer with a beautiful taunt no it is better to phrase and verbalize the subject is too dear and near done to its death already i would but suggest the cross-references and under a mean of the most atrocious conceit throw my female readers off their guard leaving my fellow-men to read between the lines for i hear that men do fall in love with women and women fall in love with loving so be it i have known girls too to take both vanilla and strawberry in their soda water which proves them to be not altogether simple in their tastes the best of them will talk volubly upon love in the abstract while the average man to which category i hope i have the honour of not belonging keeps his mouth closed on the matter with his tongue in his cheek and his ideas if he have any well hidden behind his words so if i avail myself of the feminine franchise it must be done cautiously for many are the difficulties of the young man who would love a girl to-day and only a precious few of the old school of beau would understand the twentieth century subtleties even if all could be explained many are the misfortunes in the lover's litany from which the modern maiden sighs good lord deliver us a man must take her in earnest but he must by no means take himself too seriously it is proper to treat your passion cavalierly indeed he jests at scars who has felt the most amorous darts nowadays but he must never make himself or her ridiculous he may take whimsical amusement in his own conquest but must beware the little broken laugh that spoils a kiss and above all mind you the mise en scene the stage must be set so and so the sun must not see what the moon sees sometimes you must have your heart in your mouth and sometimes on your sleeve and oftener she must have it herself 
tis very perplexing the best a man can do in this practical age is to mean business while he is about it and hold over as much for the next day as will not interfere with his commerce elsewhere the woman may take her romance to bed or keep it warm in the oven against his return but he must be out and downtown to earn his living as well as his loving amongst dollars and pounds and cent per cent while she enjoys the traffic in pure abstractions and both must hide and manage as it were a sin lest mrs grundy undo them they must snatch their kisses as it were on horseback such are the victims of super civilization there was a time the poets tell when it was not so difficult and a man might wear a lady's scarf on his sleeve and be proud of the badge it takes much more complicated machinery than that simple love to make the world go round nowadays perhaps because it goes so much faster there was a time when an elopement might be picturesque and not necessarily followed by divorce but where now shall i find the hard-hearted parent who shall justify the adventure the modern mother is too easy she is like mrs brown in the bab ballads a foolish weak but amiable old thing she reposes a trust in her daughter that does more credit to her affection than to her knowledge of human nature but woe i believe i have forgotten my manners i have insulted my fellows guide the girls and here i am on the high road to disqualifying myself with the more respectable generation so i shall cease but i will not apologize for though i came to scoff i shall not remain to pray i believe i am not more than half wrong after all there is love and there is loving and if you have followed me you know which is which it was rosalind who said some cupid kills with arrows some with traps how she would smile and sneer at this verbiage she knew a lover from a philanderer she had her opinion of the laggard and the butterfly rover and she would no doubt say cupid hath clapped him on the shoulder but i'll warrant him heart whole end of essay twenty eight essays twenty nine and thirty of the romance of the commonplace by gillette burgess this librivox recording is in the public domain essay twenty nine where is bohemia the name bohemian was first used to describe the gypsies of that nationality who appeared in france in the thirteenth century but to us the term has come to carry with it a wider significance than any dependent upon that little kingdom in the north of austria and only a few characteristic traits of those wandering vagabonds survive in those who bear whether in reproach or praise the appellation bohemian to take the world as one finds it the bad with the good making the best of the present moment to laugh at fortune alike whether she be generous or unkind to spend freely when one has money and to hope gaily when one has none to fleet the time carelessly living for love and art this is the temper and spirit of the modern bohemian in his outward and visible aspect it is a light and graceful philosophy but it is the gospel of the moment this exoteric phase of the bohemian religion and if in some noble natures it rises to a bold simplicity and naturalness it may also lend its butterfly precepts to some very pretty vices and lovable faults for in bohemia one may find almost every sin save that of hypocrisy yet if we were able without casuistry to divide misdeeds into two categories those subjective and objective in their direct effects separating those sins which hurt only the sinner from those which act upon his fellows the bohemian would perhaps be found to have fewer than most of this harsher crueler sort his faults are more commonly those of self-indulgence thoughtlessness vanity and procrastination and these usually go hand in hand with generosity love and charity for it is not enough to be oneself in bohemia one must allow others to be themselves as well 
so much for the common definition of this much-used name but no english word can stand for long in its primary meaning it must change insensibly growing from day to day till it embraces the spirit as well as the letter of the fact it expresses the word gentleman has thus grown with a secondary spiritual significance so has the word prayer by the interpretation of a more liberal far-reaching thought so with the name bohemian it has ranged beyond the vagrom in constant happy-go-lucky devil-may-care hand-to-mouth follower after pleasure and now under its banner may be found more serious enthusiasts who are not afraid to offend smug respectability and are in more or less open revolt against convention bigotry and prejudice it is their bond that they have forsworn allegiance to mrs grundy they dare be themselves without pretensions they make and keep their friends without compromise what then is it that makes this mythical empire of bohemia unique and what is the charm of its mental fairyland it is this there are no roads in all bohemia one must choose and find one's own path be one's own self live one's own life whether one makes for the larger freedom of the hills or loses oneself in the sacred stillness of the forest the way is open to endeavour wherever one wills yet though there is no beaten track there are still signs in the wilderness showing where master minds have passed here is a broken jug beneath the bough snowed under with drifting rose petals where one frail-souled dreamer loitered on the way and with his beloved filled the cup that clears to-day of past regrets and future fears singing out his heart in lovely plaint and here along a higher trail a few blazings in the forest mark where another great bohemian in this life exempt from public haunt found tongues in trees books in the running brooks sermons in stones and good in everything within bohemia are many lesser states and these i have roughly charted on my travels so that though i may have left some precincts unexplored i know at least that these territories lying on my map are veritable provinces of this land of freedom and sincerity on the shore of the magic sea of dreams beyond whose horizon dances the adventurous main lies the pays de la jeunesse the country of youth and romance a joyous plaisance free from care or caution whose green wide fields lie bathed in glamorous sunshine to the eastward lie the pleasant groves of arcady the dreamland home of love and poetry here in this greek paradise of rustic simplicity and joyous innocence and hope has lived every poet who has ever sung the lyric note and here have visited for some brief space all who have dreamed all who have longed all who have loved here is the old joy of life made manifest and abundant here mother nature speaks most clearly to her children for the most however it is but a holiday country and they who discover it often pass never to return forgetting its glories and its mysteries as they forget that lost country of their youth counting it all illusion yet some few come back to the port of peace to lose the world again renewing the immemorial enchantment to the south over the long procession of the hills lies vagabondia home of the gypsy and wanderer who claims a wilder freedom beneath the stars outlawed or voluntary exile from all restraint this country is rocky and precipitate full of dangers a land of feverish unrest one other district lies hidden and remote locked in the central fastnesses of bohemia here is the forest of arden whose green wood holds a noble fellowship bound in truth and human simplicity it is a little golden world apart and though it is the most secret it is the most accessible of refugees so that there are never too many there and never too few here is spoken a universal language nature's own speech the native dialect of the heart men come and go from this bright country but once having been free of the wood you are of the brotherhood and recognize your fellows by instinct and know them as they know you for what you are 
now as bohemia unfortunately is not an island it has its neighbours and its frontiers to the west lies philistia arid dry and flat the abode of shams dogmas and sluggish creeds here stands vanitas overlooking a great desert walled in by custom guarded by false pride it is but a step over the border however from bohemia the true to that false debatable ground whose affectations are more insincere even than the shams of the real philistia and the youngster questing the hero-haunted country of his youth chasing his phantoms may go wide of his reckoning misled by the mockery of life made by these disguised philistines in the city of shams hypocrites are content to assume the virtues they have not but here on the borders of bohemia their vices are all pretense as well on the further boundary of bohemia also hangs an unsavoury neighbour here is a madder and more terrible domain the land of lust and cruelty lawless and loveless dwelling in endless war to this fierce country vagabondia lies perilously near and many a wanderer has crossed the frontier to find himself before he knew within that evil land where freedom has become license and tolerance grown into anarchy wide across all three empires stretch the hills of fame in philistia men must be born great there is no other distinction possible save that of riches or inherited power in bohemia men achieve greatness working onward and upward bringing their own great dreams to fulfilment while in licentia those only become great who have an infamous notoriety thrust upon them by their own high crimes we cannot all mount those heights from whose crest one may look over the sea of care past the isle of idleness to the adventurous main but there is joy enough on the lowland happy indeed is he who in his journey of life has escaped the perils of that false bohemia crouching on the frontier and has found his way to the happy forest met his own people and drunk of the fountain of immortal youth for there is the warm beating human heart of the true bohemia essay thirty the bachelor's advantage there are enough who think a young man married is a young man marred to cause the bachelor to hesitate before renouncing his liberties and to fight shy of entanglement as long as possible if he writes down the pros and cons like robinson crusoe he will find he has many advantages in his single state that must inevitably be forfeited when he weds it is not only that when i was single my pockets would jingle i would i were single again it is not so much either that his play-day will be over and he must settle down stop butterfly lovering to and fro and gather the roses as he goes and have no haunting white face sitting up for him at home to ask him why and how and where this license if he be a man of sentiment he willingly foregoes for the larger possibilities of satisfactory comradeship and sympathy he can pay double rent and taxes too without grumbling take manfully the shock of surprise when expenses jump with the new establishment he may be initiated in doctor's fees and submit debonairly to a thousand restrictions of time place and opportunity but more piquant than any of these trials is the discovery that he has lost his old-time place and privilege of welcome as a bachelor that come any time hospitality of his dearest friends he is saddled with a secondary consideration try as he may no young man can marry to please his whole acquaintance the world for the most part still looks with patronizing approval upon a girl's wedding so long as she chooses or is chosen by a man not hopelessly impossible she has embraced an opportunity and usually her mother cultivates a grateful fondness for the son-in-law if he has a scarcity of amiable traits she will even manufacture them for him and put them on the market with display not so the mother of the groom she analyzes the bride with incisive dissection and it is hardly possible that any woman shall be found quite worthy to mate with her son 
it takes a woman to read women she says and the little wife has to make a fight for each step of the road from condescension through complacence to compliment the young man's friends too are exigent and he soon finds that though the two have been made one in the sight of law and clergy society knows no such miraculous algebra you may squeeze in an extra chair at the dinner-table for a desirable and interesting young man but to include another lady and that his wife requires a tiresome rearrangement he does not come alone ordinarily nor would he if asked and so he drops out of his little world and must set about the creation of a new one he may have had latchkey privileges at a dozen houses free to come night or morning the recipient of many sudden invitations for theatre supper or country but that is all over it is his turn to do the inviting the table has been well turned when he sits down to meet is it to be wondered at then that the bachelor is selfish he escapes lightly the lesson of compromise his whole life is a training in egoism and he makes the most of his desirability getting usually far more than he gives he is free to experiment in acquaintance though it goes no farther than innocuous flirtation he may make friendships for himself and break them at will lightly dodging the tie there are hundreds in every city who need to go only where they wish skipping even duty calls sure of forgiveness he may know men and women he cares for and through the lack of experience in a lifelong intimacy he may preserve many illusions as to women if he has an income or a profession that demands no abode he can wander to and fro on the earth and walk up and down in it free as satan he travels the farthest who travels alone still uh, this cannot go on for ever and his franchise wanes with the first pang of middle age nature asserts her imperious demand for permanent companionship the cons grow heavier and the pros more attractive he sees maid after maid of his younger fancy pass out of the game without regret but the first sight of the new generation strikes him to the heart he is uncled by more and more adopted nephews and nieces and the sight of their fresh eyes awakens the immemorial longing in him and then suddenly another pro comes upon the list an undeniable item of importance throwing its influence so heavily upon the side of marriage that no number of his foolish little cons can ever balance the account he is in love and there is but one definition for that state it is the immediate ravenous compelling desire for a wife there is nothing for it but to renounce allegiance to his old friends and become naturalized into a new citizenship but though all over town the doors to which he cried open sesame bang sullenly to shut him out he does not notice it if that one portal lets him in End of essay thirty Essays 31 and 32 of The Romance of the Commonplace by Gillette Burgess. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Essay 31. The Confessions of an Ignoramus. Musicians tell me that I am exceptionally fortunate. I know absolutely nothing of music. It is not a bald, fathomless innocence, however. I am not tone-deaf, for instance, and certain compositions please me and knowing nothing i have been treated with indulgent complacence by the profession and amongst them i have the unique license of being privileged to like whatever i choose it is no small distinction this nowadays when one is nicely and strictly rated by his compliance to the regnant mode but i have to fight tooth and nail to defend my innocence i have determined that whatever happens i will not be educated for a while once on a time i hazarded my franchise of free speech and weakly accepted the tutelage of a master that i might at least gain a familiarity with the catchwords of the musical fraternity it was the more reprehensible and foolish because i had already lost my virginity in art circles by the same servility long ago i learned to phrase and gesticulate at the picture galleries and try as i may i cannot forget the formulas 
i learned to stand with eyes half closed before a painting and waving my hand murmur i like this part in here i caught that knowing waggle of the right thumb and prated of modelling tricky work atmosphere composition values with such humbuggery i could say straight-faced and with a vicious explosive gesture oh it's good in colour but it just lacks that you know by jove i was in it up to the ears before i knew it and now my critiques are detailed to the semi-elect as coming from one of the cognoscenti i have learned the terminology of the craft so well that my very instructors have forgotten my novitiate but an art exhibition is a horror to me for i go bound by the tenure of hypocrisy and dare not walk freely forced to rattle my chains as i limp through the forbidden pastures of delight the candy-box pictures and chromos that my soul loves with that fierce first love that never dies so i have learned to avoid the pyrian spring now having escaped the seductions of euterpe by the merest chance he is said to be a fool who is caught twice by the same trick and i write myself down a worse-witted clown yet when i confess how far on the high road to folly i was before i jumped the fence of conventional parlance and broke for the wide fields where lies my freedom i had been led astray by practising the non-committal remark oh what is that as soon as the piano keys cooled off from the startling massage of the furious performer i was bold i even dared to be the first to speak and i threw ambiguous meanings into that well-known exclamation for i was assured it was always safe whether it followed a moskowski mazurka hot from the blunt fingers of a kansas city poor relation or a somnolent chopinian prelude hypnotized by the evening star i learned that the statute of absorbed attention had expired and that the lifted eyebrow the semi-concealed shrug the overt smile behind the performer's back and the ex post facto resentment of all these in one mucilaginous compliment were now good taste bah i sickened of it all soon enough for i had been piously brought up and my puritan blood was anti-toxic to the corruptions of the musical microbe and so i have forgotten to speak of grieg as a mere sentimentalist and all the rest of the pharisees phrase-book thank god i can hear the mill in the forest and check up its verisimilitudes item by item even as i have dared to renew my youth with charles dickens and laugh cry and grow hot and cold with scott's marionettes yet as i said my innocence is not altogether empty there is indeed no such thing in life as absolute darkness one's eyes revolt and hasten to fill the vacuum by floating in sparks dream patterns figures whimsical and figures grotesque shifting clad in complementary colours to appease the indignant cups and rods of the retina and so my musical ignorance is alive with a fey intelligence of its own i have come at last to an original conception of what is good and what is bad by its mere psychological effect as illogical as a woman's intuition yet as absolute and empirical as the test of acid and alkali by litmus it has come to this that i know now i shall never hear good music again when i was young the phrase classical music was still extant i come of the middle classes where one calls a spade a spade and that variety of sound the most expensive of noises was as incomprehensible as was the training for its appreciation arduous so that beauty for its own sake was unknown or lurked behind the horizontal mountains of truth that shut in the new england landscape but as my knowledge and love of art grew and i mingled with those that spoke this foreign tongue of beauty i had opportunity of hearing music the only music that was worth while to them the music that endures and lives continually virile and creative curiously enough and unhappily for me so long a stranger to such influences 
i found that some compositions spelled me with their subtlety tranced me into reverie while others awakened active feelings of amusement surprise or scientific curiosity as to their construction and so ignorant of technique and composition harmony and all the rules of the art i have gone back to the woman in me and trust to her little ounce of instinct when the vibrant chords the sobbing pulsations and the mystical nuances grow faint and die away as my dream mounts on the wings of an invisible melody leaving the sawing bows the brazen curly horns the disc cylinders strings keys triangles curves and tubes with which paraphernalia the magicians of the orchestra have bewitched me far far below where i soar aloft naked and alone in the secret spaces of my soul i know not then but afterward that the talisman has been at work and as the rhythm dies and i drop drop to the world again and turn to the trembling wide-eyed girl at my left and am roused by the brutal applause that surges around me i know that this was music but i have not heard it alas shall i never hear it essay thirty two a music box recital hid secretly in my heart i long had a passion for music boxes while i was innocent of the ways of the world and thought that art as some think that manners had a ritual to which one must conform in order to be considered a gentleman i hid this low-born taste from my friends and talked daintily of brahms his frozen music of the architectural sonata and other things i did not understand how musicians and artists must have laughed at me when they saw my hands square constructive palms willful thumbs and mechanical fingers music box hands but though i had long ceased cutting stencils of other people's thoughts and frescoing my own vanity therewith i dared not confess to john this wretchedly vulgar penchant for the music-box of commerce the small varnished brass and cedar affair which is the only instrument i can play but at ten of the clock one night the yearning became so intense in me that i burst the bonds of my discretion and lo at the first word john fell heavily into my arms he too cherished this unhallowed joy in secret and had long hidden this tendresse behind a mask of propriety we dried our eyes and were into overcoats and out on the street in a single presto measure set to a swift staccato march for the bowery we must have a music box apiece before we slept we swore it in a gray forte oath prestissimo but we were hungry for a good three-dollar package of discord it was none of these modern contrivances with perforated discs and interchangeable tunes we were after not the penny in the slot beer saloon air shaker nor the anthropomorphic pianola only the regulation old-fashioned swiss instrument would serve the music box of our youth the wonderful complicated little engine with a cylinder bristling with pins that picked forth harmonies from the sole of a steel comb its melody limpid with treble accompaniments lively sustained at the small end where the teeth are small and active with a picture of children skating on the cover top and beneath under glass oh rapture the whirring wheels all in sight tempting the small inquisitive finger of youth after an incredible amount of discussion as to the relative merits of the repertoire we came to a decision and fled home to abandon ourselves to the distractions of our tiny orchestras the boxes were so full of music they have been trying to empty themselves ever since but the magic purse seems inexhaustible one night in my idyllic youth a german band played all night long under my window but now i would carry the divine gift of music in my overcoat pocket i was like that persian monarch for whom was made the first pair of shoes your majesty said his vizier now at last for you indeed is the whole world covered with leather as thou hast demanded o oh, allah now for me was the whole world patrolled with german bands they played say au revoir but not good-bye under my pillow 
they gave me honey my honey as i ate my breakfast before the week was up we had learned every tune by heart down to the last grace note in the accompaniment we had learned too the sequence of tunes inevitable unchanging as the laws of the meads of old never again shall i be able to hear sweet marie played without a shock that it is not followed by the isabella waltz never again shall i hear the end of honey my honey without a tremble of nervous suspense till comes the little click of the shooting cylinder the apprehensive pause and then hurrah the first gay notes of sweet marie but we could not long endure the perfect simplicity of the airs and the old touch of super civilization led us on to attempt to vary and improve the performance of our songs it was john who discovered the virtue of a few pillows stuffed on top of the machine and he achieved immense con expressione effects by waving the box wildly in the air i contented myself with changing the angle of the fan wheel so as to make it play allegro then one got so very much music in such a very little while surely a pardonable gluttony had my box been larger i might have heard seven complete operas in an hour like the old duke in sylvie and bruno yet after all it was versatility of quality rather than mere quantity that should be the greatest victory and we set out on experiments in timbre at last we found john and i that by inserting a little paper cylinder under the glass so as to press on the keys we could give susa the grip as one might say and he would cough and wheeze in a way to amply discredit the statement that there is no such thing as humour in music a greater thickness of paper gives the effect of a duo with mandolin and banjo and this was by far the most successful of our variations i should end as i began i know by a bit of maudlin philosophical moralysis i might for instance trace the resemblances in the musical world and say that for me the conductor waving his baton is as one who winds the key to a very human music box in which each tooth of the comb is a living vibrant human being or i might broach a flagon of morality forby and show how each one of us plays his little mental tunes in a set routine wound up by the great musician what devils stick their fingers into our works and bid us play more fast or slow more loud more low what jests of fate who inserts her cacophonous paper cylinder that we may wheeze through misfortunate obligatos of pain but no my forelegs are stuck in the bog of realism and i shall not budge from the literal presentation for my little kingdom of delight suffered a revolution it was john's fault for john had been affecting a musical countess who gave afternoon talks on the art of listening in a studio dry molecular analyses of nasal quartets and such like verbiage so he came home late one night while a music box was bowling away merrily upon the couch with a one pillow soft pedal it was my music box too bah he swore your box phrases so abominably it is so cold so restrained so colourless hear mine now isn't that an excellent pianissimo there's polished technique there's a chiaro scuro oh listen to that cat come back my machine is an artist yours is a mere virtuoso mine is a joachim a d'albert yours is a mousin a da Konsky get into the smooth suave legato of this wonderful box here is a bureau octaves hark to those scales like strings of white-hot pearls dropping upon velvet he was moaning and tossing as he snored these parodies it was a nightmare both for him and for me at four o'clock in the first pink grey of the morning i could endure it no longer i rose haggardly and threw the two music boxes into the fire End of Essay 32essays thirty three and thirty four of the romance of the commonplace by gillette burgess this librivox recording is in the public domain essay thirty three 
a plea for the precious now if a youth as mad-headed as i without bookishness or literary education of any sort with neither much of anything to say nor much desire to say anything if such a charlatan would have his wares bought and his words read he must be antic beyond his contemporanes a shorter word than the english equivalent whereby i go forward one step in brevity and back two in translation he must pique curiosity and tempt the reader on he must pay a contango which is by the same token a premium paid for the privilege of deferring interest he must in short be precious a quality essentially self-conscious this has been at times a popular pose in letters and when successful it is a sufficiently amusing one as poses go but i name no names for the sake of the others who fall between the stools of purpose and pretense who tie as one might say two one-legged beggars together and think they have made a whole man if i have lured you so far into the web of my vagary pray come into my parlour too and be hung for the whole sheep that you are that i may fleece you close with my sophistries before you go i have but one toy here to amuse you i juggle idioms and balance phrases upon my pen and whether you laugh at me or with me i care not moi but as seriously as is possible seriousness is not my present pose i assure you i would i might wheedle some of your dogged clogged rugged ragged fagged foggy wits out of you and constrain you to accept my pinchbeck for true plate the while for i have a little sense in my alloy after all and you might go further and fare the worse than by my chatter if i dared i would jump boldly into my thesis without apologies but it so happens that it is one that should be itself its own illustration i should convince you of its truth by its own garment of expression instead of depending upon my logical introductory presentation but this i fear to try my pistols i fear are as the duchess of malfi might say loaded with nothing but perfumes and kissing comfits now that you are well a-muddled and like to turn to a saner page let me buttonhole you with one clean statement while you stand gasping indeed i fear that a dozen have fled already from my gibbering and i speak to but one sullen survivor determined to collect his promised interest we know then the joy of colour taste sound and odour as mere sensual gratifications undiluted with significance but since i seldom read i have never seen the apology for the sensual pleasures of diction pure and simple in its essence swinburne i hear has his lilts and harmonies in poesy and perhaps that is the nearest like except for the purpose that drives his chariot but i am for that runaway mood that gallops gaily forth into nowhere unguided and unrestrained a uh, twenty bookmen shall come up to me no doubt with their index fingers set upon examples but i am happier in my ignorance and i prefer to think it has not yet been done or at least not exactly as i mean indeed you may depend upon me to evade proof with some quibble your didactic prose is a wain pulled over the hard city streets fiction is the jaunting car that paddles down the by-side lane poetry wallops you along the bridle path with your mistress muse on a pillion and but very rarely dares cross country over a low hedge or two but always after some fleeting hair of thought but i i am for the reckless run over the moor and downs the riderless random enthusiasm of nonsense so out of my way gentlemen of the red coats or i bowl you down mazeppa might do for a figure but his steed was hampered with the load his runaway had too savage an import and it is my purpose to be only a little mad pegasus is a forbidden metaphor nowadays he is hackneyed by the livery of vulgar stables i prefer that black horse 
vanned and terrible who flicked out the eyes of the second calendar as my mount is like to serve me in the sonata is an exemplification of my theory there now is a vehicle that carries no passengers save what one's fancy lades it with it charges and soars with no visible rein to guide it except when a thread of melody steers it into some little course of delight so there is a secret rhythm in the best prose that is more subtle than the metres of verse and which is to the essay what the expression of the face is to the talker one may indeed use that same word expression or gesture instead of the common term style but a common or house observation shows us that there is some pleasure in the face whose lips are dumb and i dare say there is joy for the coxcomb and the female fop in the unworn gown as it hangs on its lonely nail or is draped on the lay figure of meaningless meaningful form so it is to such harebrains and cockatoos i appeal come to my masquerade and let us for a wild half-hour wear the spangles and tights of palistric impropriety hid by a visor that shall not betray our thought in this lesser pantomime one may be irrelevant inconsequent and immature and sport the flower of thought that has not yet fruited into purpose can you find your way through this frivolity mixed metaphor and tricksy phrase and see what a wanton a paragraph may become when one sends it forth free from the conventional moralities of licensed literature i have been to many such debauch and have got so drunk on adjectives that i thought all my thoughts double in this harlequinade too there are more games than my promised sonata i will mock you the mill in the forest or any other descriptive piece with coloured words parodying your orchestra with graphic nonsense i will paint the charms of the dance in seductive syllables or no better the long forthright swing of the skater this way that way fast and faster the ice king's master the nibble of the cold the brush of the rasping breeze the little rascally hubbies where the wind has pimpled the surface and the dark blue-black slippery glare beyond where damn it i shock you with a raucous expletive and you plunk into a dash of ice-cold remonstrance up to your ears and flounder cold and dripping tooth-loose and grey with fright so at the expense of good taste and to the grief of the judicious i force my point upon you en garde messieurs and answer me i find few enough who can play the game with me or for me the age of chivalry is gone in horsemanship as well as in feats of arms and sword-play who knows the demi volt the caracol the curvet the capriole or the rest of the seven movements who is elegant in the high menage or raised airs who prances for the sheer delight of gallant rhetoric on le totes astiasm or on a modopea fain would i be bedeviled but the magi are passed away i must fall back on dr johnson's pious flimflam but the humours of his verbiage are in me not in him yet the new century carnival is proclaimed and over the water there are i hear a few who are to revel with king rex in the empire of unreason on this side the nearest we have got to it is a little machine made nonsense ground out for the suppositious amusement of babes but what i mean is neither second childhood nor bombast nor buffoonery nor silliness nor even insanity though that is nearest the mark but a tipsy hell-raising with this wine of our fine old english speech it has been too long corked up and cobwebbed by tradition sanctified to the elect and discreetly dispensed at decorous dinner-tables by respectable authors and ladies with three names who also write it has been too long sipped and tasted mincingly out of the cut-glass goblets of the literary table gentlemen inebriates all i wave you the red flag 
a torch this way what ho roisterers up younglings squadlings dapchecks devil-may-cares and mad-mannered blades to the devil with the tipstaves and tithing men constables beadles vergers deputy sheriffs and long-lipped parsons a raid on the wine cellar to break flagons of good english and drink 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 till your heads spin there is joy and intoxication in the jolly old bottles that shakespeare and his giddy phrased buccaneering crew of poets filled by gad slid i scorn it to be a consort for every humdrum hang them scroils essay thirty four sub rosa perhaps i am as discreet honourable and loyal as the ordinary man but i confess that at times i have a frantic desire to escape to the moon and tell all i know or to unburden myself of the weight of dynamic confidences pouring my revelations into the ears of some responsive idiot in the old days a corpse was fastened to the felon's back in punishment of certain crimes and to me a secret seems almost as deadly a load the temptation to vivify the tale and make it walk abroad on its own legs is hard to deny there are secrets so dangerous that to possess them is foolhardy it is like storing dynamite in one's drawing-room an explosion is always imminent and publication would mean disaster i have known secrets myself so outrageous so bulging with scandal that had i not promptly forgotten them they would have undone society twenty times over there is a titillating pleasure in the keeping of such terrific truths and it increases one's inward pride to think that one knows of another what if told would change the aspect of a life the temptation to tell is like being in church and suddenly seized with an almost irresistible impulse to shriek aloud or like standing at the verge of a cliff and being impelled to throw oneself over to give way to the perfidious thought means moral death and when one falls one brings others down as well many of us though we conceit ourselves to be worthy of trust are as regards our secrets in a state of unstable equilibrium women seeing and feeling things more personally and subjectively than men are especially hazardously poised so long as the friendship with the confidant is preserved the secret is safe but let estrangement come and suddenly the balance becomes top-heavy one's morality falls and the secret escapes in the crash of anger i have known women who felt themselves quite free to tell secrets when the proper owner of them proved guilty of unfaithfulness the difference in viewpoint of the sexes seems to be this men have a definite code of honour certain well-recognised laws of conduct acknowledged even by those who do not always obey them the brand of the dog is upon him by whom is a secret revealed if a woman is honourable in the man's sense of the term it is a test of her individual character and not of conformity to any feminine ethical system most men for instance and some women especially when influenced by love or great friendship will keep a competence not only passively but actively as kipling's hafiz teaches if there be trouble to her word and a lie of the blackest can clear lie while thy lips can move or a man is alive to hear it seems right too that in lesser cases one is justified in lying to protect one's own secret as in disavowing the authorship of an anonymous book for one surely need not be at the mercy of every questioner the true confidant is not a mere negative receptacle for your story but a positive ally on the other hand there are those who hold that a singular and prime friendship dissolves all other obligations whatsoever and that secrets betrayed are the greatest sacrifices possible upon the altar of love montaigne says the secret i have sworn not to reveal to any other i may without perjury communicate to him who is not another but myself there are few friendships nowadays so close as his with etienne de la boite who himself would not so much as lie in jest theirs was one of the great friendships of history 
but there is much casuistry used by those who would manifest their importance in knowing mysterious things they obey the letter of the law and tell without really telling letting the truth leak out in wise hints and suggestions or they tell part of a tale and hoodwink themselves into thinking that they have violated no confidence yet nothing is so dangerous as half a truth it is like pulling one end of a bow-knot sooner or later it is inevitable that the hearer will come across the other side and the cat will be out of the bag but some secrets have so great a fiction interest or such sensational psychology that one is quite unable to refrain from telling the tale without names or localities perhaps merely for the story's sake this is perhaps permissible when one really tells for the study of human nature rather than as gossip it is dangerous always but a clever person can so distort certain details that the true characters can never be traced for myself i would never demand absolute confidence for i would never tell anything to anybody whose discretion i could not absolutely trust and a friend can as often aid one by telling at the proper time as by keeping silent some secrets are told only for the purpose of being repeated what one cannot tell oneself one must get others to tell for one and this trick is the theme of many a farce women understand this perfectly it is their code and men laugh at it feeling themselves superior the three quickest ways of communication cynics say are telephone telegraph and tell a woman women are notoriously fond of secrets it is their only chance for romance no man who desires to obtain a woman's affection should forget this not that it is necessary to initiate her into your affairs but you will as soon as possible see that something happens which she may consider it wise not to tell cement her interest with some lively secret that ties you to her irrevocably so that she cannot come across your photograph or your letter without a knowing smile there are those too who hold that their own idea of a secret's importance is the excuse for divulgence or defence but a man of honour will keep the secret of a child as closely as that of an intimate friend the ass who surrounds his every narration with mystery and takes needless precautions has his rights and though you may hear the tale at the next corner you are still bound to silence some respect their own secrets but not those of others and have no compunctions against wheedling out a confidence from a weak acquaintance thereby becoming accessory to the fact of his faithlessness a secret discovered should be held as sacred as a secret confided the desire to tell secrets is one of the most contagious of diseases and few of us are immune some vigorous moral constitutions never succumb but once an epidemic begins it is hard work stopping it and a secret on the rampage is well nigh irresistible tell your secret then broadcast and let it have its way until it dies out or else lock it in your own heart but above all confide it not to her who asserts that she never has the slightest desire to tell for there like a seed sown in fertile ground it will germinate and flower long after you have forgotten it ay and bring forth fruit you never planted end of essay thirty four end of the romance of the commonplace by gillette burgess